Good morning and welcome to the Fall 2017 Seminar in American Religion. My name is Kathleen Sprose Cummings. I direct the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism, and I'm a faculty member in the Departments of American Studies and History here at Notre Dame. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, our longtime seminar participants, as well as so many new faces. And I want to extend a particularly warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the very first time. As we begin our morning, I want to introduce briefly the Kushwa Center's two new postdoctoral fellows, Peter Chaika and Benjamin Wetzel who both joined us this summer. Many of you know Ben already. Ben received his PhD in history from Notre Dame in 2016 and served as a teaching fellow in the history department last year. Ben, could you wave? Oh, there he is. <laughs> Many of you may have also met Pete Chaika, who received his PhD from Boston College earlier this year and has been involved in many different Kushwa events over the years, as well as a research travel grant recipient. Pete, thank you for waving. We're very grateful to have the two of them with us at the center, and especially for those of you who are our regulars, if you haven't met Pete or Ben yet, uh, I'd encourage you to introduce yourselves at the break. Since 1980, two times each year, the Seminar on American Religion has provided historians of North American religion and other interested scholars an opportunity to discuss a recent notable book published in the field. The topic of our seminar today is Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's latest book, A House Full of Females, Plural Marriage and Women's Rights in Early Mormonism, 1835 to 1870, published earlier this year by Knopf. I'm pleased to introduce the seminar's panelists, and of course, we'll begin with our guest of honor, the author. Professor Laurel Thatcher Ulrich is the 300th anniversary university professor in the history department at Harvard University. She received her BA from the University of Utah, her MA in English from Simmons College, and her PhD in history from the University of New Hampshire. Before joining Harvard's faculty in 1995, she taught at the University of New Hampshire for 15 years. Laurel has published numerous articles on early New England, women's history, Mormonism, and material culture in several journals, among them Feminist Studies, William and Mary Quarterly, Journal of American History, and the American Historical Review. She has contributed contributed chapters to over 15 edited volumes, and is known for multiple books, including Good Wives, Image and Reality in the Lives of Women in Northern New England, 1650 to 1750, A Midwife's Tale, The Life of Martha Ballard Based on Her Diary, 1785 to 1812. This second book won multiple awards, including the Pulitzer Prize and the Bancroft Prize. The Age of Homespun, Objects and Stories in the Creation of an American Myth, Tangible Things, Writing History Through Objects, and Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History. Many of you will recognize that title and be familiar with its origins. Uh, Laurel's early career includes my favorite example of an obscure academic research article going viral in the opening paragraph of a 1976 American Quarterly article about Puritan funeral sermons. Laurel coined the phrase, Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History. Uh, years later, it is still found on bumper stickers, coffee mugs, and t-shirts throughout the country. And I learned last night, if you want to swing by the Notre Dame bookstore on your way out of here, uh, in the greeting card section, there is... Um, uh, <laughs> this title might also remind you that this is Laurel's second visit to the University of Notre Dame. This was also the title of the Provost Distinguished Women's Lecture that Laurel delivered here in 2006. But if coining a phrase has made Laurel Thatcher Ulrich a household name, it is her brilliance as a historian that has earned her a stellar and enduring reputation among scholars. Laurel's a MacArthur Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow. She served as the president of the American Historical Association in 2009 and president of the Mormon Historical Association in 2015. In addition to her scholarship, Ulrich has written extensively on her Mormon faith and co-founded the Mormon feminist magazine, Exponent Two. I'm thrilled to welcome Laurel back to campus, particularly for this event. Thank you for joining us, Laurel. It's an honor to have you here. We're fortunate. All right. We're fortunate to have two excellent commentators to get our discussion started this morning, Patrick Mason and Linda Perbyshevsky. Patrick Mason is the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies in the Religion Department at Claremont Graduate University, where he also serves as Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. His specializations include Mormon history, American religious history, fundamentalism, and peace studies. 
Patrick received his PhD in History and Peace Studies here at Notre Dame and has held teaching positions at Notre Dame and at the American University in Cairo. He is a nationally recognized authority on Mormonism with regular appearances in major media outlets including the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, NPR, PBS, and the Huffington Post. He is the author of The Mormon Menace, Violence and Anti-Mormonism in the Postbellum South, and has edited or co-edited several volumes, including War and Peace in Our Time, Mormon Perspectives, Directions for Mormon Studies in the 21st Century, and Out of Obscurity, Mormonism Since 1945. Patrick has also published a number of articles and book chapters on Mormonism, American religious history, and religion, conflict, and peace building. He is currently finishing a biography of Ezra Taft Benson, as well as a co-authored volume, Developing a Mormon Theology and Ethic of Peace. We're fortunate that Patrick has returned to Notre Dame to be with us today. Linda Perbyshevsky is Associate Professor of History and Concurrent Associate Professor of Law here at Notre Dame. She received her BA from Northwestern University and her MA and PhD in History from Stanford. Before coming to Notre Dame in 2005, Linda taught in the History Department at the University of Cincinnati. Linda is a historian of American religion and law who also specializes in the history of American fashion. Her first book, The Republic According to John Marshall Harlan, was published by UNC Press in 1999. She has published on law and religion in the Journal of American History and the Journal of Supreme Court History, as well as many other venues. Her booklet entitled Religion, Morality, and the Constitutional Order was published in 2011 by the American Historical Association. And her most recent book, The Lost Art of Dress, The Women Who Once Made America Stylish, published with Basic Books in 2014, was a New York Times bestseller. Linda is currently finishing a book on the Cincinnati Bible War of 1869 to 1872, and in 2016, she received a public scholar grant for this project from the National Endowment of the Humanities. Linda's work has been supported by several Mellon Fellowships, the Spencer Foundation, and the NEH. She has been a fellow with the Program in Law and Public Affairs at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School and with the American Council of Learned Societies. Linda, thank you for being with us today. For those of you who are new to our seminar, just a quick note on the format. We'll hear from each of our commentators first, and then Laura will have an opportunity to respond to some of their questions briefly. We'll take a quick coffee break and reconvene and open the floor to a general discussion. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first commentator, Patrick Mason. Thanks, Kathy. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's great to be back at Notre Dame. Thanks to uh, Kathy for inviting me, for uh, Pete and Shane and the other staff of the Kushwa Center uh, who have made this possible. And, and so it's, it's great to be here uh, back in Indiana. I don't even recognize the campus anymore. It's like a whole new university was built uh, since the last time I was here. So Linda and I decided that uh, I'd go first today. Uh, I've uh, pitch my remarks partly knowing that there might be a few in the audience who have not done their homework uh, and have not uh, uh, read the book or maybe finished the book today. So, so, uh, so part of my comments will be pitched that way, but also with some, some questions and, and insights for, for Laurel, uh, perhaps. So 10 years ago, Jan Ships wrote in the Journal of American History, Joseph Smith, Rough Stone Rolling, Richard Lyman Bushman's biography of the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, is the crowning achievement of the new Mormon history. Ships was reviewing Bushman's landmark 2005 biography of Mormonism's founder and referring to the 40-year-old intellectual and historiographical movement that modernized, depolemicized, and in many ways secularized the study of Mormonism. I'm gonna borrow a bit from Ships in stating that a house full of females, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's sweeping account of women's essential and unique participation in the shaping of the early Mormon movement, stands not just as a major accomplishment of women's history, religious history, and indeed American history, and not just as an exemplary work of Mormon women's history, but as the crowning achievement of the lived history of early Mormonism. This book is simply the best account of what it was like and what it meant to be Mormon in the first three decades of the religion's existence. And I expect that its resonance will be felt for scholars of women and religion in other traditions, even those who didn't experiment with polygamy, which mercifully was most of them. Scholars of other religious traditions should be uncontrollably jealous, not only of what Ulrich accomplished in this book, but also what she had to work with. She lightly complains in the introduction about the relative scarcity of Mormon women's diaries compared to those kept by men. 
But in comparison, what would we give for the minutes of house church meetings often hosted by women in the first several decades of the Jesus movement? Or for the diaries and correspondence of the wives of Muhammad recorded at the very time that a new world religion was being birthed that revealed their social networks and the patterns of their daily lives? Or a blow-by-blow firsthand contemporaneous account of the 10 plagues of Egypt and the Hebrews' exodus into the wilderness? Of course, were such records to exist, we might learn that bad water, frogs, lice, locusts, and hailstorms were all just another day at the pyramids. Or we might discover that indeed, such things were unique in the context of the time and place in which they occurred, thus entering us into the realm of the special, the inexplicable, the abundant, even the miraculous. Indeed, Ulrich begins her final chapter, aptly entitled, The Records of This House, with a brief meditation on historical sources. It's about the closest thing we get to an editorial from the author in this book. Because Eliza Snow wrote things down, Ulrich observes, the the Nauvoo Relief Society has a history. Because she and others kept records at winter quarters and in early Salt Lake City, we know that even without the Relief Society, women continued to meet together to speak in tongues, bless one another, and heal the sick, and that they participate in the Council of Health, the Polysophical Society, and the Indian Relief Society. Ulrich at once celebrates that these things have a history because someone wrote them down, while also lamenting that a great deal of what women did has been lost because no one wrote it down. I recall a conversation I had a few years ago with Colleen McDaniel, like Ulrich, also an accomplished historian of materiality in American religion and history, who's now writing a history of 20th century Mormon women. McDaniel told me that in all of her years of studying 19th and 20th century American Catholicism, she hadn't encountered even a fraction of the women's diaries that she has in her work on Mormonism. Though historians have in recent decades applied any number of creative means to recover women's lives and lift up women's voices, the fact is that so much of the history of women is inaccessible to us because no one wrote it down. By the way, this is why I want all of you to join me in pressuring Laurel to write her memoir as her next book. I tried at dinner last night. She was being stubborn. And so A House Full of Females is not just about Mormon women or Mormon history. First and foremost, I read it as a portrait of a first-rate historian in love with history and especially with historical sources. The result is, in Ulrich's words, a quilt bringing together fragments from diaries and other day-to-day records such as letters, occasional poetry, and minutes of meetings. Of course, these kinds of sources are the stock and trade for almost all historians. And the fact is that few of the sources Ulrich uses are newly discovered. Her most important sources, especially the diaries and the Nauvoo Relief Society minutes, have been well known to Mormon historians for decades. But nobody reads sources like Laurel Thatcher Ulrich does. She has forged her impressive career less as a miner of new nuggets than as an alchemist turning known and seemingly ordinary materials into gold. In a biographical project I've been working on in fits and starts over the past few years, I've always told people that I have no interest in what my subject ate for breakfast on a Wednesday morning. But in A House Full of Females and other books stretching back to Good Wives and A Midwife's Tale, Ulrich shows that sometimes a diary entry about breakfast, or the weather, or who paid a social call, might actually be really important if we care about the textures of people's lives and believe that those individual strands when woven together skillfully are what make up history. Ulrich is committed to the resplendence of everyday life. This helps explain her dogged, almost dogmatic devotion in this book to contemporaneous sources. Memoirs, autobiographies, and later reminiscences are essential historical sources, she recognizes, but they are crafted by people who know and in many ways are constructing the end from the beginning. On the other hand, when Azuba Woodruff recorded a disagreement about which of the wives was going to do the laundry, including the diapers, which she wonderfully calls shit and cloths, how was she to know that a future historian would use that entry to help detail the effects that plurality had on the domestic economy and the complex household relationships within an alternative marriage system? As Ulrich notes in her introduction, this is not to say that diaries are more truthful than memoirs, 
just better at conveying the instability of events as they unfolded. Diarists did not know how things would turn out. So what do all these marvelous sources tell us? For non-specialists in Mormon history, I expect that the, virtually the entire book from start to finish will be a revelation. Of course, there's the headline grabber of polygamy, which I'll talk about in a minute. But there's also so much more. I recall sitting in a seminar with George Marsden years ago in a building not too far from here and startling him with the news that Mormons were heavily engaged in glossolalia as early as the 1830s. So too, people are surprised to discover that Mormon women regularly administered blessings of healing in the church's early decades, despite being denied ordination to priesthood office. A recent discussion with two of my colleagues at my university left them dumbfounded when they learned of the depth and extent of the suffering of Mormon refugees who had been driven from their homes in Missouri in 1838 and Illinois in 1846. And the Utah War is all but forgotten, including among Mormons. But for those who regularly read the Journal of Mormon History, attend the annual conference of the Mormon History Association, keep up in the burgeoning field of Mormon studies, none of this is surprising. And Ulrich's account may seem to offer little new in terms of the broad strokes or periodization of the first decades of Mormon history. But this is not a book that aims to destabilize established historical narratives so much as it infuses those narratives with extraordinary depth and texture. Ulrich quietly makes the case that history is best apprehended not through the impressive deployment of theories imported from other disciplines, but rather through a careful, patient, and sensitive focus on the sources, which are animated by big questions and then presented via extended character studies and narrative descriptions. A Houseful of Females offers no grand theories about women in 19th century America or marriage in Western civilization or religion and secularity. It is rather a study in granularity and particularity. Ulrich's analysis of the album quilt sewn by the women of the Salt Lake City uh, 14th Ward Relief Society in 1857 becomes a metaphor for her entire enterprise. The whole cannot be fully understood separately from a detailed examination of its individual component parts, which in turn cannot be fully understood except in relationship with the others. I was initially surprised when a book putatively about women's history featured men's voices so prominently, in particular those of Wilford Woodruff and William Clayton. As dogmatic as Ulrich is about the use of contemporaneous sources, she's not doctrinaire about telling women's stories only through women's voices. As she points out, Mormon women were in the male authored diaries, letters, and patriarchal blessings all along, but often in fragmentary form, thus requiring a careful process of excavation and reassembly. After all, it's only through men's voices that we learn about female dominant branches of the church in the American Northeast or Herefordshire, England in the 1830s, or female prophets such as Eliza Bromley, whose dreams and visions often guided and encouraged the male missionaries. Nevertheless, in Ulrich's deft handling, it's the women who shine. Through them, we learn, as Ulrich says, what it meant to live day to day inside a utopian dream. But what Mormon women had hoped to be a dream often turned out to be a nightmare. Loss is a persistent theme in these women's and men's lives. Chapter six, I found, chronicling the muddy Mormon slog across Iowa in 1846, is equally illuminating and heart-wrenching. Ulrich manages a narrative drenched in pathos without ever becoming maudlin. Eliza Snow noted a funeral train following to its wilderness grave a little child. Eliza Lyman blankly wrote of her own lost child, the baby is dead and I mourn his loss. We could not bear to part with him, but we were powerless. He was buried on the west side of the Missouri on the second ridge back, the 11th grave on the second row counting from right to left, the first row being farthest from the river. This will be no guide, as the place cannot be found in a few years. In Ulrich's humane rendering, human tragedy is counted not with statistics, but with a mother's numb grief. Of course, all humans deal with death, and recent studies suggest that Mormons buried their loved ones at no higher rates and perhaps even lower rates overall compared to other groups of Overland Trail migrants. But not all humans deal with polygamy. 
which remains the albatross around Mormonism's neck over a century after its practice within the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ceased. So let's talk about polygamy for a moment, shall we? In a 2007 Pew Research survey, when respondents were asked to describe their impression of the Mormon religion in a single word, polygamy was the number one answer, followed by family or family values, cult, and different. Just two weeks ago, while traveling in China, after I left the dinner table one night, uh, with, I was at dinner with a group of Chinese hosts, the first question they asked my colleagues who remained behind was how many wives I have. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint them. Mormon plural marriage has been the subject of countless exposés and anti-Mormon tracts, and slightly fewer, but nevertheless a significant number of scholarly studies. Until now, the title I would regularly recommend to students or others interested in Mormon plural marriage was Catherine Dane's 2001 book, More Wives Than One, The Transformation of the Mormon Marriage System. I still believe More Wives Than One is the best single treatment of the subject, especially valuable for its combination of qualitative and quantitative analysis of how Mormon marriage practices worked as a system. Ulrich's book is a wonderful complement to Dane's, demonstrating how polygamy actually worked on the ground, or just as often didn't. Over the years, plural marriage has been particularly vexing for feminist scholars. Did it oppress women or paradoxically liberate them? Ulrich, herself a pioneer of both feminist history and Mormon feminism, sticks to her method and steers away from the simple oppression liberation binary, moving us instead into the territory of complex human identities, beliefs, experiences, and relationships. So how do we make sense of 19th century Mormon plural marriage? Relying on their own accounts, Ulrich suggests it was many things to many people, including a religious vocation, a form of spiritual and economic security, a way of defying convention, a religiously sanctioned way of leaving a troubled marriage, a mark of loyalty to Joseph Smith and other later church leaders, an opportunity for committed relationships among women, a story of promised life beyond the grave, a source of consolation and reward in the face of loss, and a reproductive and child-rearing collective. Some of these redeeming features notwithstanding, Mormon polygamy also contributed to a culture of secrecy in early Mormonism sowed confusion within families and communities, contributed to the hardening of a particular Mormon form of patriarchy and masculinity, and placed enormous pressure on both women and men to conform to a system that challenged their fundamental moral norms and values. It provoked in women a range of emotions including anger, ambivalence, confusion, instability, and anxious acceptance. Most of all, polygamy broke people's hearts, especially women, but also men even if they had come to accept it as a true religious principle and practice commanded by God and ultimately destined to win them an increase of eternal glory. Mary Richards wrote, there's no such thing as happiness known here where a man has more than one wife. It really seems to me that this is a day in which woman is destined to misery. Even where Ulrich is able to document a seemingly happy and well-functioning polygamous family, as in the case of George, Bathsheba, Zilpha, Hannah, Sarah, and Lucy Smith, the five wives' contentedness seems to have stemmed from their ability to each imagine an intimate relationship just between husband and wife, rather than a plural relationship between husband and wives. More than any other book, A House Full of Females reveals Mormonism's polygamous society to be a hot mess. Shot through with contradictions, ambivalence, and often less than elegant improvised solutions. There were men who objected to it, such as Addison Pratt, the first Mormon to circumnavigate the globe, and couples who embraced the principle but avoided the practice, such as Pratt's in-laws, Jonathan and Caroline Crosby. The earliest, earliest period of plural marriage in Nauvoo was particularly messy. Ulrich notes as many as 20% of women who became plural wives before Joseph Smith's death had at some point been married to other men, and that at some point included now. In a story that utterly defies the modern imagination, Henry Jacobs allowed his beloved wife Zina to be sealed to Brigham Young in the Nauvoo Temple. Henry went on a mission, Zina eventually joined Brigham Young's expansive household, and the Jacobs never again lived as husband and wife. 
Recognizing the pain that plurality caused, Heber Kimball, one of Mormonism's senior leaders and most ambitious polygamists, admitted, there is not one respectable woman in this church but what would feel bad under such circumstances. And I know there's no woman can ever feel worse than my wife has done, and she is just as good a woman as ever lived. And I never blamed her for feeling bad, but loved her the more. For her part, Heber's first wife, Violet, of whom he so approvingly spoke, while courting other wives, wrote in verse, may he be the father of many lives, but not the husband of many wives. <laughs> These sentiments are nice, but Heber must not have felt too bad for Violet, nor did she stand in the way as he eventually married a total of 43 women, having 66 children by 17 of his wives. I've lingered on this point because while I've read many books about polygamy and firsthand accounts by polygamist wives and anti-Mormon novels and tracts exposing its many horrors, this book unsettled me more than any of the others. I was left asking the question that many of Mormonism's critics have also asked for nearly 200 years, why would anyone become Mormon? Furthermore, how did the earliest Mormons learn how to be Mormon? It's far easier to make a convert than to make a Mormon. The first generation of Latter-day Saints were not socialized into the tradition. They chose it in the midst of a marketplace of many other perfectly good options. To be sure, they enjoyed spiritual and social rewards within the Mormon community, and Ulrich does a wonderful job detailing the intense religiosity that characterized women's meetings throughout this period and which certainly served as a powerful anchor. But because people didn't start keeping diaries until after their baptisms, and sometimes not until years afterward, in most cases, Ulrich's sources fail her and us in answering the question of why they joined in the first place. The book seems to concede that it's not even a question that can be asked with this particular methodology, as any answer would necessarily rely heavily on testimonies given after the fact, which were often highly stylized and formulaic. Furthermore, because a house full of females picks up some six years after the publication of the Book of Mormon and the formal organization of the church, it assumes a Mormon community without querying how that community came into being and what role women played in birthing it. The midwives of Mormon origins, Lucy Mack Smith, Emma Smith, Mary Whitmer, along with all the others who failed to keep a diary, have virtually no place in this house full of females. We can get close to the religion's Big Bang, both as a movement and in each individual convert's life, and sense its after effects, but we are left to theorize about actual origins. So just as the Relief Society both expanded the place of women in the organizational life of the church while also exposing the limits of their authority, so too Ulrich's chosen method expands the place of women in history while also exposing the limits of firsthand contemporaneous accounts. If the book perhaps doesn't reach back in time quite far enough to get to the origins of Mormonism, my feeling is that it overreaches a bit at the very end. The last chapter so desperately wants to get to 1870, the year that Mormon women held their indignation meeting and first voted, that I felt it rushes, which was a jarring feeling at the conclusion of a book whose strength comes in lingering over details and savoring every source. Juxtaposing plural marriage and women's rights offers the perfectly paradoxical subtitle, but the last chapter covers so much ground in just getting to the formal achievement of women's rights by way of suffrage that it tantalizes more than it satisfies. Then again, so did suffrage, and so did plural marriage. But these are mostly the critiques of someone placed in a position where it's expected to offer critiques. Any reservations or extra wishes I have are flimsy in the face of a remarkable book that will be valued for many years to come by those who care about Mormon history, women's history, religious history, American history, and just plain old history. Historical sources have rarely had it so good as to be placed in the hands of Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, I want to thank everyone for inviting me, and uh, it is an honor uh, to have re-met Laurel um, Ulrich, whose book, Ulrich rather, sorry, whose book, um, whose books I know. <laughs> um, and uh, in fact, I was thinking about um, the midwife's uh, diary. Um, because at one point my husband said, how's it going? Because the book's really big. <laughs> and I said, well, can I complain about Wilford Woodruff's diary being so long? If I'm complaining, when the book is written by a woman who has written the best book ever written using a diary. In fact, when you give people the midwife book, undergraduates in particular, they fall down in shock <laughs> at what um, Professor Ulrich managed to do with it. Um, and my husband said, well, I guess you could say you got tired of Mr. Wolford Woodruff, mostly because he remarries, and I don't really like him for that. But then my husband said, but as you know, well-behaved <laughs> women seldom make history, so you're allowed to make trouble. Um, I don't want to just be saying, okay, there's too much of Wilford in here, because I don't think that's what I'm saying. What I'm really intrigued with um, is what you can get out of these diaries. Uh, and, and the book calls them Heavenly Archives and Early Records, and I think of them as do-it-yourself spirituality, okay? which is really common in the 19th century. I mean, it is in a century of incredible religious ferment. Uh, and I think we sometimes forget that. And then sort of we put the Mormons aside as this odd example, when actually there is so much going on in the 19th century. So much so that a woman named Lucy Max Smith actually wrote, she was not gonna be choosing a church, because if I join some one of the different denominations, all the rest will say, I am in error. That was Joseph Smith's mother, <laughs> who just gave up. She got baptized outside of a church because the religious ferment around her was just too confusing to deal with. So among the amazing things we get in these diaries is not only the extraordinary efforts of spiritual life, but the extraordinary aspirations of spiritual life, um, especially for Mormons, in which men become all priests, adult men. Actually, nine-year-olds become all priests, actually, if need be. Um, and Mormon marriage, in its distinctive uh, quality, makes people into gods. Ponder that as an option in 19th century America. Not just angels, not just heaven. You can be a god or a goddess. Um, and if you don't go along with it, especially when it comes to plural marriage, you can be damned. <laughs> so what's in these diaries is amazing, but what's not in them is also amazing. When Woodruff won't talk about polygamy, when he won't say, I married Mary Ann Jackson, or here she is, or I divorced her, what does it mean when you kind of sin by omission in a diary? What does it mean when you leave something out of a diary? That question became as important to me as, as what was actually in them. Because who is this diary for? Is it for Woodruff? Is it for us? Is it for God? Is it for the church? Or do we just not want to create a document which could be used in a court, in a hostile court of law? And that brings me um, to the question of women's rights. And Patrick is certainly um, right, that this is a granular study um, of these people in their daily lives and their spiritual lives. And so there are no grand theories, as it were. Um, but as a legal historian, I want to ask about women's rights. And really the deepest question, which is what are rights? Now we have the simple answer we tell students. Rights are what you can go to government right, and demand of it. You can demand protection. You can demand the right to exercise something. That, that All of those things happen. Now, marriage is a really weird right. It's a contract. It's a legal contract, right? Um, it is also the only legal contract I can think of that is also the most intimate relationship um, two people can possibly have. 
And usually it's, it's really a deal when you think about it. And students, I think, are a little too quick to sort of dismiss all 19th century marriages as really bad deals. Um, but, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the deal where the woman says, I'll run the household, I'll have your children, I'll support you in your public effort, and the man says, well, I'll earn a, a living, and I'll make a name for myself in some way, and, and um, that's the deal. The problem with the deal is usually it was the only deal you were offered if you were female because you couldn't support yourself financially. And secondly, very often you couldn't enforce the deal, right? It's, it's very difficult to go to law, actually. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, though, in the opening chapter, um, basically says, uh, polygamy, shlamigamy, uh, monogamy or polygamy, they're all the same because they all oppress women. So all 19th century women are chumps, but are polygamous women the bigger chumps, I think, is the question that, that hits a lot of people. Which brings me to Emma Smith. The remarkable, unmovable Emma Smith. <laughs> Who doesn't believe Joseph Smith's revelation about polygamy? Um, whom Brigham Young calls, in a great quotation in the book, one of the damnedest liars I know of on the earth. Yet there is no one good thing I would refuse to do for her if she would only be a righteous woman. I think Smith, um, not Smith, Young rather, who blamed Emma Smith for Joseph Smith's uh, death, uh, literally damns her um, and believes her damned. Um, I also expect that if she had accepted polygamy, that would have made Emma Smith righteous. But what does Emma Smith do instead? Um, and and uh, early in the book, uh, Laurel writes about women's voices trouble the old stories. I think Emma Smith's voice <laughs> troubled the Mormon men um, who follow after Joseph Smith terribly. because. Emma Smith knew um, that Joseph Smith was the 19th century equivalent of today's promiscuous husband who is sleeping with the nanny, except that Joseph Smith then knew that God had told him to sleep with the nanny and to marry her as well. Uh, Emma Smith, on the other hand, knew that God had never told him any such thing. And, and Laurel lays out in a fascinating way um, how Joseph Smith actually threatens her with destruction um, and she just refuses to budge. Um, she works first on morality issues within the church. She then threatens to divorce him, and uh, doing so gets a property settlement. I am 99% sure when she threatened to divorce him, she probably uh, did so with the knowledge, either explicitly or implicitly, to him uh, that she could um, get him into terrible trouble with the law if she chose to, if she opened her mouth. And then she remarries and makes a property settlement to protect her property. A very troublesome woman to Mormons, but in many ways an extremely wise woman when it comes to former wives. So Emma Smith. Um, you know, where do we put her uh, within the story of women's rights? And then where do we put the women who left bad husbands behind, the drunks, um, and joined uh, Mormon marriages, uh, polygamous marriages as well? And Ulrich raises the question of consent, but I think the real question is who determines what a Mormon marriage is? What kind of deal is it? Um, is it the husband? Is it the wife? Is it the wives? Um, and as Patrick pointed out, we see a, an incredible amount of pain and humiliation endured by these women um, you know, um, in exchange for what? Uh, support, heaven, goddess, status eventually? Um, it's hard to say. Um, Augusta Cobb is a fabulous character within this book. The impoverished and really lively wife of Brigham Young who just won't let him off the hook. She clearly was not satisfied with the deal she made at all. Um, 
she actually also raised for me the question of sexuality and the, the question of the control of women's sexuality, which crops up in various ways inside the book. Um, there are some frighteningly early marriages of what we would consider today children. And there are also places where Brigham Young and others draw the line that these are girls who are, who are too, too young um, to be able to give consent. There are examples such as Wilford Woodruff when his younger wives decide to go off and flirt for a while. And I just wrote in the, in the margin, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> because I don't think women's sexuality is really recognized by the Mormon men, um, except to reproduce. Um, that is his only purpose. And then there are the, and I love this phrase, what a great quotation, skitty wits and alias whores. Um, young women who went and found army men uh, to flirt with, um, and they got called whores by polygamous men, which I thought was a kind of interesting irony. Um, and it seems pretty obvious to me that they made a terrible error in identifying polygamy as the solution to prostitution, which really tells you it's the solution to male lust, not the solution to getting more souls into the Mormon church so we can all go to heaven better. Um, I want to talk for a minute that if that's, if that's all the sort of interesting problems this raises about women's rights within marriage, there's also the question of voting rights. And as Patrick said, that last chapter where we're kind of sprinting through things um, is, is, is um, ah, makes you want for a bit more, uh, which is a mean thing to say when it's like, this book is pretty substantial. Um, but the ending chapter has this sort of fascinating um, sort of summation. Living their religion, they, this is the women, learned wisdom by the things that they suffered. And when the opportunity came in 1870, they defended the right to speak for themselves, which is this indignation meeting which we began the book with. And I kept thinking of what should be our comparisons to other women in other churches, et cetera. Um, I thought of Christine Hireman talking about women in Southern uh, churches, Baptists and Methodists, who gain spiritual power very early in the church and then end up losing it out to men with power. But then there are also women who are clearly training into political power within other churches. Nancy Eisenberg's work. Uh, came to mind. Uh, these are women who are petitioning um, not always for their own rights, but actually for others. Uh, women who learn to petition through churches for the rights of Native Americans in Georgia, for example, who are using land uh, for the for the slaves. Um, you know, the, the anti-slavery movement. I was even thinking of Stephanie McCurry's book, Confederate Reckoning, to think about Southern white women who learned to petition their government and to complain during the Civil War about the way they're treated. Um, so I was trying to figure out if we could think about what is it um, or what are the ways that, that women learn political uh, power. Obviously, it's not just from being a Mormon, um, I'm not even sure it's just from being religious or through churches, but I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Obviously, the persecution of Mormons makes them a distinctive case in some ways, but other, other sects have been persecuted as well. And I also, I, I will end up having a factual question that hit me this morning, it's, which is that women get the vote in Wyoming and Idaho and Colorado, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, so if those territories also gave women the vote, were they just trying to catch up with Utah? Or is something else going on there as well? Um, and, uh, and the thing I think to keep in mind over all of this notion of women's rights is 19th century women do not gain rights in a 20th century way or a 21st century way, i.e. they seem to have gained rights from the argument from difference, not the argument from equality, i.e. women get rights not because they're like men, but because they're unlike men. Um, Norma Bash is, is the one who early on wrote the book that realized that the Married Women Property Acts right, are passed not to empower women, but to prevent 
father's property from going to stupid sons-in-law when they want their daughters to be able to keep hold of it, right? So it's, it's not about empowering women so much as disempowering stupid sons-in-law. Um, Eileen Craniter um, noticed that it was the argument from difference that got women the vote. Um, uh, women should have the right to vote not because they're like men, because men are kind of bad and, as we noticed, less spiritual and, and immoral. Um, I think of Jane Addams making uh, the argument to Chicago women uh, why they needed the vote. It's to keep your city cleaner, which is to keep your, your children safer, to keep your family safer and healthier. It's not because you deserve the vote because you're just like men. It's because you deserve the vote because you're mothers, and mothers do certain kinds of tasks. Um, and I think that's something we forget because when we do talk about rights as legal historians, we tend to be thinking the argument uh, from equality, not the argument from difference. And I guess I just want to end by talking about the phrase, the house full of females, which is actually, if you look at what Woodrow's talking about, not about a polygamous household per se, but about these women coming together to do work. Um, and, and this is really fascinating to me. Uh, women working, socializing, partying, and speaking in tongues, right? All at the same time sometimes. Uh, and clearly from the start, and there's this great little quote on page eight, some of them got right huffy <laughs> about being, um, not allowed or not invited by the men to wash and anoint to do one of these rituals. But they did get men's permission, and this is a quote again, to pray, testify, speak in tongues, and prophesy, and then to use their healing powers. So there are distinctive spiritual ways in which women are empowered within this system, but always I'm thinking because men approve of it. They do certain things when men are away and they don't do them apparently because they think men would disapprove of it. Um, but they sometimes need the approval of men. Um, the first relief society is dismantled um, and it's history written out of the church's records um, because uh, the men well, in the first place, because Emma, Emma um, Smith had been in charge of the Relief Society and Brigham Young didn't like her and thought maybe the society was up to something. But, um, you know, it's so clear that the women kind of never forget that. Eliza Snow wants Joseph Smith's promises to that Relief Society in Nauvoo to be, to be fulfilled. Um, and I, I, guess, I guess I'm not trying to be a binary, <laughs> uh, as Patrick pointed out on, you know, women good, bad under polygamy. I thought, oh, then really, no, I'm bad under polygamy, but under Mormon religiosity, I'm, I'm, I think it's a very fascinating and mixed record. And I think one, the one thing I want to leave you with, and I think that this book shows more than anything else, is that women's work was essential. Uh, it was essential not only to the church, but it was essential to the households, to survival. It was, it's simply astonishing the amount of work and effort and just sweat um, that these women expended um, in the telling of this story. Uh, but the question, and I, and I think this is not just Mormon women, obviously, I think any pioneer woman was obviously doing extraordinary work that would make us flinch now, but the question is, Women's work was always essential, but then what did they get for it in return? Um, and I guess I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, my assignment, as I understood it, was to make a few short comments on a few of the points raised. Um, and I really thank both Patrick and Linda for these very, very helpful and interesting uh, comments. 
The, uh, let me see if I can succinctly say what I think I heard here. I heard from Patrick a, an extraordinarily generous and uh, laudatory, I would say, celebration of the granularity of my book, my absorption with sources, my um, ability to tease out of small fragments something about the texture of lived experience, lived religion, as it played itself out in early 19th century Mormonism. Toward the end of his comment, he said, but there, there were some problems. Um, it was not the definitive history of polygamy or plural marriage. It was not the definitive, it, didn't, it, it, it happened too fast in the last chapter as I came to the circular organization of the book, which begins with women standing up for their rights as Latter-day Saints in a grand meeting in 1870, and then I returned to that meeting at the end, hopefully having answered the question of how that meeting happened. But he wanted more in that last chapter. So um, I agree, absolutely. Um, my husband is, continues to tell me, you've got to write the second volume. <laughs> As originally planned, this book was going to end in 1890 with Utah statehood. And it's, actually, it was going to end with the manifesto, end, ending polygamy, um, a manifesto issued by none other than Wilford Woodruff, that annoying guy who is all the way through the book. I could not get there in one volume, and I do not intend to write a second <laughs> volume. Um, so it's a case of a book plan and the book reality. What really happens when you have a 400-page book and you haven't completed the entire story from the origins of plural marriage to its end, through the lens of one man's diary with a lot of help from some other diarists. That was my original plan. My original plan was subverted by my inclinations as a historian and by what I find an impossible task, which is to pull myself out of the everyday life of ordinary people into grand pronouncements about what kind of a deal Mormons had in marriage or some of the really large and important and very significant questions that Linda raised. Linda raised really good questions as only someone who is both a legal historian and a dressmaker can, can raise them. So I really appreciate both of these comments. They're both spot on. And so I have a confession to make. Uh, the biggest problem I have had, um, well, let me rephrase that. I've gotten really incredible amount of praise for this book. And, you know, it's the kind of thing where I want to back up and say, you know, is it really that good? <laughs> or are people, you know, they, they don't want to offend the senior scholar who's had so many honors and, you know, does that happen? Does it get kind of hard to critique somebody who's sort of, you know, a pinnacle and also about to retire and go away? <laughs> so. So here's the confession. Uh, the last task, as most of you know, in publishing a book, especially with the trade press, is to come up with a subtitle. There was never any question in mind about the title of the book. And I, I thank Linda for raising the phrase, a house full of females was always my story, and my story was all about 
the intersection of two dimensions of Mormon women's lives. One, in the house, the phenomenon of lots of females in the house, the phenomenon of plural marriage, and the other, which to me was always the more important story, maybe because of my own um, experience as a Mormon feminist, was the creation of powerful, strong, supportive, activist female community outside the house, actually in the house that they eventually built, the 15th Ward Meeting House, which replicated Joseph Smith's red brick store and which was built for, built by, funded by, used by women for women and their activities. So I was less concerned about women's rights in the national scheme or anything else than I was about the intersection of private life, family life, and the church community formed and shaped by women for women within the larger religious institution. That's what a house full of females meant. But I was also interested in sharing with the larger world the news, and it is news, and I think it's important news, that these were not universally downtrodden, miserable victims of male oppression, that they also had agency, strength, and power, and the ability to express themselves. OK, so how do you say that in a subtitle? <laughs> I could have said, a house full of females, plural marriage, and the female relief society in early Mormonism. Who would have gotten that story? Nobody. It was a real problem. So after a long time, I, you know, I went through a lot of varied subtitles, uh, family and faith in early Mormonism. So household in the larger religious community, family and faith in early Mormonism. Obviously, I came back to the moment of honesty and said to myself, what is this book really? It's a book about diaries. It's a book about how to read a diary. It's a book about how to take these day-by-day -day sources of various kinds and probe into them and make a world come alive. So when I handed in the final draft, it was a house full of female Mormon diaries, 7, 1835 to 1870, which felt to me like the most honest title, hoping somebody would see that a house full of females had something to do with women and women's history. Obviously, that wasn't going to work. And my editor, she wanted all kinds of things, from uppity women to <laughs> spirited women. And you know, they weren't spiritualists. And there is a book with that title, and I couldn't use that. We went round and round and round. And um, I did the best I could at the very last minute and came up with plural marriage and women's rights. It had to have plural marriage in it or nobody would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and women's rights, I still think is better titled than some of the others we talked about. Um, but it required a much more vigorous explication, and Linda asked great questions, what is a right? Um, I was concerned about the rights within the religious community, and the answer I came to at the end, I believe, was sustaining their community with all its flaws and all its agonies was to them important and powerful and they stood up for their community. It was that horrible cross-cutting phenomenon of women being both women and participants in other identities. A woman is both a woman and a Muslim. And a woman can be both a woman and an African-American, can be both a woman and a Catholic, 
And when your dual identity is threatened from within, and I think I said that in the introduction, they were standing up for their rights within Mormonism by standing up for their rights as Mormons. It's politically savvy. They got the Relief Society back, which was one of their goals. And it became, that's volume two, it became a pretty powerful organization. So, um, but you're right, both of you, the last chapter is way too rushed. The excuse, of course, it's not an excuse, it's a reality. The diaries disappeared. But um, anyway, this is the story about writing books and how they change <laughs> as you struggle with your topic. And I'm so grateful to you all for reading it. And I um, am hopeful, actually, as I said to my husband, other people are going to write those volumes. You've heard some great questions from both Patrick and Linda. And they'll use other kinds of sources, other kinds of materials, other vantage points on this story. It's definitely not a settled story. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, Patrick, and Laurel. I think we have a lot to discuss. Uh, this has raised a lot of questions. So now we'll just take a very brief five-minute coffee break. And when we come back, the floor will be open for discussion.